Adam, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Hanging right in there, man. Just another day in paradise. Absolutely. How are things in beautiful Colorado today? Uh, beautiful for a change. The wildfires have been unreal. Yeah. It, it's really prohibited a lot of you know, my outdoor plans. I had a mule deer tag and an elk tag. And the place I was going to go hunt elk, I actually had to turn my tag back in because the wildfire just ravaged the area. Right. So I didn't get to chase elk, which in, in hindsight is probably a good thing. I wasn't in shape. I wasn't ready. I didn't get the scout. Um, yep. My mule deer experience about made me cry. So I, <laughs> I couldn't imagine trying to chase an elk, uh, you know, something that's probably three or four times as big as a mule deer. So yeah, and then have to get it all back out. Mm-hmm. And I'm out here by myself. I don't have any really buddies. You know, my, my neighbor offered to help, but he works, you know, he right. Has, yeah. How do you just say, Hey, uh, you know, drop, drop what you're doing and, hike out here three or four miles and help me pack, you know, two, 300 pounds of meat out. <laughs> now, please. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it, it probably worked out for the better and it gave me a chance to, you know, focus on the podcast stuff more, which is something I've been enjoying. Um, and so how long have you been doing the podcast? I, I went back and, uh, you know, listened to a few different episodes, but. Uh, I just started it in June. Okay. So a little bit of background. Yeah, so you guys have been, you put out quite a bit of content then since June. Yeah, I try to do one a week. Uh, nice. My goal is to do two a week. Okay. Um, I moved here from Ohio last year and I, you know, I became a stay at home dad and dealing with two kids and not work. And I've, I've worked my whole life. Right. It was a big adjustment for me. Well, my buddy back in Ohio asked me to help him out with his Facebook page, which is called 12 hike. Um, his original idea was to just get people outside, you know, one day a month to go hiking. Right. Well, I'm, I'm a podcast junkie. I love listening to podcasts. And I thought here's a perfect opportunity for me to, you know, try something a little different since I'm not working. It's something I've always wanted to do. It doesn't hurt anything. I might as well try it. Nice. So what has your background been in terms of work? What, what uh, were you doing before you? I've always been in sales. Well, the bulk of my career has been sales. Uh, okay. I worked at a, a little building supply store uh, and I started there right out of high school and I started managing the place right away. And whenever I first started, <laughs> one, of the, one of the guys looked at me and said, you don't know green beans from apple butter. And I always thought that was so weird. I thought, what are you talking about? And he was right. I knew nothing. Uh, it right. was a brand new experience for me. So that, you know, those old timers took me under their wing and I just, I spent a year doing nothing but working in the warehouse when I was supposed to be managing the store. And that really, I think that was formative that, that really helped me because it, you know, my strength was always, I understood what I was selling. Right. And I got that understanding from those guys, you know, basically making me handle it for a year. Yeah. And, and people, people can tell when you have that firsthand knowledge and when you don't. Oh, for and sure. It's always, it's always really telling, you know, when you're dealing with a customer, they can, they can pretty well see through that pretty quickly. Yeah. And you know, for us being a small, you know, like a hometown building supply, we had to fight the corporations, Lowe's, Home Depot, uh, Menards. Yeah. And the only way we did that was just with knowledge. You know, someone could walk in, ask us a question, we could answer it. And that went a long ways. So I, I did sales for, oh gosh, 13, 14 years, you know, working 45, 50 hours a week and pew, nothing. <laughs> now, well, I say nothing. Now it's actually a lot harder. You know, I work harder taking care of kids than I did managing a building supply store. It's crazy. It's, it's something else, isn't it? Oh my gosh. And they're four and six and they run me all over the place. I just, I can't keep up with them. Yeah, I've got, uh, I've got twin nine-year-old boys, so I, I know where you're at. We always said we'd like to have twins, so we get everything out of the way all at one time. Do you think having twins is harder than maybe having them spaced out a little bit? I mean, I don't know because they're my only two. They're my, you know, I don't have any other reference. Yeah. Um, 
you know, there's something to be said about having, you know, having done that baby time kind of together and not going through it twice, I guess. Um, I guess, you know, the, the thing about having them and going through different stages at once is that you don't get that stage again with another kid, right? You're, Mm -hmm. you're, um, you know, you're walking at the same time, you're talking at the same time. And so there's no, there's no, there's no experiencing any of that over again. It's just kind of all, all, um, you know, sequential. Yeah. That's, I know, uh, the, the, we're finally have my youngest out of diapers. We're not pot, we're not, you know, we're working on potty training right. and, uh, I, I forgot how great it was not having diapers to change. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you get to leave the diaper bag at home and you're like, I'm free. You know, oh my gosh. <laughs> and that, that's made going out and adventuring so much easier. You know, we've got all kinds of reservoirs and, you know, forest around us and trying to take them kayaking while one of them was still in diapers was always a big problem. Yeah. And yeah. now I've got, you know, I, we take them kayaking, but getting them to sit still is a nightmare in a kayak. Uh, I That's why up, I bought a canoe. <laughs> well, I thought about that and they're so much heavier. Uh, I know you can get some that are a little bit smaller, shorter. Not if you, It's all about the material, man. I've, I've got a 16 foot, boat in my house that weighs 40 pounds really and yeah it's a okay. kevlar mad river explorer save that thought because i want to talk about some of that stuff later like whenever we actually start talking okay. about kayaks yeah um, totally but yeah, i thought about a canoe but i went ahead and got a, a pamlico it's an older one i think it's the thir- 13 5 mm-hmm. and it's great but man when i have my youngest one sitting in front of me <laughs> it's a uh, it's a, it's a worry about him just going bloop over the edge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, come back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So a little bit of background about you, Adam. Uh, how long have you been, what's your position with Wilderness Systems and how long have you been there? So I'm the brand and product manager for Wilderness Systems now. And so I've been doing that. Uh, I've been, I've held this position for about four years now, but I've been with Confluence, which is our parent company for about 15 years. Uh, So when I first started with Confluence, I was in the customer service um, arena. And Mm -hmm. so I came in and started answering consumer uh, questions kind of right off the bat. So, you know, if you had a question about your tsunami and you wanted to know how to do something or just had any questions in general, you know, if you called in or sent an email in, you would you would talk to me on the phone and I'd be there to help. Uh, From there, I moved into a couple of different sales and marketing roles through the years and then uh, four years ago, I I came into this position. Okay. Have you always been a a kayaker? Uh, So I started kayaking about 20 years ago. Uh, Really, I kind of started outdoors as um, more of a hiker and a camper. You know, when I was young, I was uh, involved in Boy Scouts and we were lucky enough to have a really good um, troop with great leadership that was very active, you know, so we made sure that we were out at least once a month hiking or camping uh, in some way or another. Um, so that was great. That got me started as a, as a kid. Um, and then, uh, you know, started, uh, really kind of from back, uh, camping into backpacking and spent a lot of time backpacking. Uh, and then once I moved to Augusta after I graduated, uh, high school, I started working in a local outdoor shop down there and all the guys who, um, worked there were all paddlers. And so I was like, you know, this looks pretty neat. Um, and so I started tagging along with those guys and then I've uh, been kayaking, kayaking ever since. Do you specialize in a certain type of kayaking or do you do, cause for me personally, I'm a recreational kayaker and a fishing yeah. kayaker. I don't do white water. Uh, I'm much more, I'm, I'm too fat and too chill for all that stuff. Yeah. So I started out as a whitewater kayaker, um, and spent most of my, you know, paddling career as a, as a whitewater kayaker. Uh, and then kind of transitioned over into some touring stuff, uh, you know, taking longer trips, um, camping out of, a, out of a kayak, that sort of thing. Um, and then as I have gotten into working more with wilderness systems specifically, you know, getting into the fishing side of things, I've never really been um, a fisherman. You mm-hmm. know, it's, it's really interesting. One of the cool things about um, working in this arena, though, and working with fishermen is, is uh, the, the learning that I've done over the past few years, having you know, the team that we've got and uh, having access to them and, and just really kind of learning from them and learning fishing from them has been a really cool aspect of, of the job over the past few years. So how did you actually begin working with Wilderness Systems? Did you uh, get a contact through that first job you had at the outdoor store? 
Yeah, so um, way back, um, Confluence went through a merger. Um, Confluence was Wilderness Systems Kayaks, Wastework Kayaks, and Mad River Canoe. And then they actually purchased um, Perception Kayaks and Dagger Kayaks from another company. And that merger happened. And when that happened, all of it relocated to the Perception factory down in Greenville, South Carolina. And um, I had been talking to our sales rep at that point. And I was like, you know, if you guys decide that you need any help up there, just, you know, call me and, and uh, I'd like to get into this side of the industry. You know, having worked in retail, it was a, a really good experience, but I wanted to see kind of what was on the other side of that. And uh, he called me back and said, well, we've got a couple of openings in customer service. And so uh, I came up and interviewed and uh, been here since. Okay, I'm going to fanboy for a minute. I've been holding it back, but I can't anymore. I Wilderness Systems, to me, uh, it should be worldwide, whatever, is is the best kayak I've ever been in. Um, I've got the Pamlico and I've got the Tarpon 120, which the Tarpon 120 was the first kayak I ever owned. Um, right. I, I did research and research and research, and I, I sat in them and I sat in them and I sat in them. And that will... That, Tarpon 120 is hands down. I don't, I don't know that I'll ever buy another kayak. Although you, there's a, there's a new one coming out that you guys have that I'm probably going to proposition you for later. That's um, all right. Yeah. We can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, wilderness systems has had a really unique history kind of in, in the boat building business. Um, you know, they started out making uh, whitewater squirt boats and I don't know if you have any idea what that is, but it's nope. a really, it's a really weird kind of uh, whitewater boat that's um, it's just thick enough for you to be able to get into. You have to really put it on kind of like a pair of pants, you kind of s- squeeze down into it. Uh-huh. And you actually interact with the water underwater. So there's this thing called a mystery move where you actually kind of sink your whole body down and you spin around and you actually paddle underwater. And that sounds terrifying. <laughs> It definitely takes a, a unique kind of individual to, to do that. And so that's what they started doing in, in uh, 86 when they founded the company was that they were making composite squirt boats. No kidding. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, evolved from there into the, the touring market really was kind of their next evolution. And then from touring into uh, recreational boats and fishing and into kind of where we are now in, in terms of a really almost a full service line through rec touring and fishing. And the umbrella, you know, you've mentioned Confluence. Uh, that umbrella is very large. I didn't realize it was that big. Uh, yeah, so we have uh, Wilderness Systems Kayaks, Mad River Canoe, Perception Kayaks, Dagger Kayaks. We also own uh, Harmony Gear uh, accessories as well. Yeah, I love the Harmony Gear accessories. That's great. Um, yeah. Although I haven't really utilized a lot of the features on my Tarpon 120 just because I haven't needed them. Uh, but the, the slide tracks system, yep. oh, that's, to me, that's a game changer. Uh, were you guys on the forefront of putting that kind of stuff on your fishing kayaks? Yeah, we were, we were right at the beginning of that. So we um, did that in the second version of the, the tarpon that we launched. Um, I think in like, I want to say we did that boat in 08 mm-hmm. um, was when we launched that one. And we were definitely one of the first folks to be able to use that technology in a boat. I know mine. Um, I bought mine in 2013, and to me, at that time, I I hadn't seen really another kayak like it. Yeah, well, um, I think some folks in the boating industry kind of were doing it, and so we, so we adapted it over to kayaks, and you know, just made it really easy to be able to swap out accessories uh, for you know whatever you're doing that day, right? If you want to go out fishing, you put some fishing rod holders on there. Um, now you can even put things like Bluetooth speakers on there. If you're into that kind of thing, Mm -hmm. um, you know, GPS mounts, just any, anything that you want to be able to put on a boat and be able to take it back off again really easily. Yeah. And the, the one thing that I wanted to get, but I never did was the, the skeg attachment where you could, you know, yeah, Yeah. to me, that was a game changer. My wife, I bought her the 10 foot version and she always had a problem with tracking. You know, it didn't track as well as my 12 footer and I always meant to get her one, but just never did doggone it yeah they, they, they make a big difference uh it's, it's interesting the rudder really helps um that's really kind of what the rudder's there for is to keep the boat straight a lot of folks you know think that it helps with turning but in a kayak 
um, really counteracting the wind and keeping you from kind of spinning in the wind and helping you paddle straight over a longer distance is kind of what a rudder is really there for um, yeah. on a kayak as opposed to, to turning like it would be on a, on a ship. Yeah, and we noticed that really big. We went on a, a lake paddling tour somewhere and we had touring kayaks. It was windy. Um, the rudder on her kayak has started to malfunction. It wasn't going down anymore. Right. So uh, we paddled out to this little island and she struggled to keep up with me because I was, I'm stronger than her anyway. But, you know, it's just one of those things where I give a couple of paddles and shoom, cut through the water. Right. We got to the island and she said, you're giving me your kayak because I can't do this anymore. <laughs> So I had to give up my rudder to kayak, but yeah, it makes a big difference. It's, it's incredible. And uh, has, so as far as from those first boats, the squirt boats, uh, right. what kind of research went into changing the materials of, of how a kayak or a canoe were made? Because yeah, so it seems like they're getting lighter, better, stronger. They definitely are. And, you know, plastic, I think, was the, the biggest evolution in terms of construction that was that was made um, because it allowed us to really build boats quickly. Um, and it wasn't necessarily a custom process at that point. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the refining of plastic since then. So roto molding really was started as a way to just get a nice even thickness kind of over over a shape. Right. And you don't necessarily need plastic on the top like you needed in the bottom. And so throughout the years, one of the things that we've done is, is the science and technology behind putting plastic where you need it and taking it away from where you don't to try to make it as light as possible, but still strong in those places. Mm -hmm. And then just changing in, of plastic in general. If you look at plastic from when we started making boats to now, the kind of the number one, um, enemy of plastic is, is UV, right? UV radiation. Um, and the difference in the amount of UV inhibitors in plastic now and, and what they're able to withstand compared to what those early boats was is, is, is night and day, um, night and day difference. And when it comes down to tailoring your boats, your different boats to your different uh, audiences, do they, do they look at very specific things for their boats? For example, for me personally, when I was looking for a fishing kayak, I wanted something I could sit in all day and be comfortable. Yep. And when I got into the tarpon and I, I felt the seat in that boat, all the adjustments it can make, I was sold. That was it. And, you know, the first thing, you know, whenever people ask me, what do I look for in a kayak? The first thing I tell them is a comfortable seat. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that, comfort is really kind of one of the cornerstones of what Wilderness Systems is about. We sort of led the comfort, what I call the comfort revolution in sort of the early 2000s. When I first started paddling, um, in order to be comfortable in a boat, you literally had to cut out foam and glue it into your kayak. And you sort of made your own seat on top mm -hmm. of the plastic that was in there. And you shaped it out by hand with, uh, you know, sandpaper and, and different tools to try to make a comfortable fit. And so Wilderness Systems uh, in introduced the phase three seating system, which had the adjustable leg lifter on it, the back that went up and down, and in addition to, you know, kind of adjusting for angle and um, really started making comfort a cornerstone of, of kayaking at that point uh, and making it easy to be comfortable in a boat. Um, and so, yeah, definitely um, comfort. And then, you know, the other things that we look for in a, in a boat are performance and performance really is defined by the user, right? So for fishing, performance means having a nice stable boat that you can stand up in and move around in sometimes. Um, Sometimes performance means going in a straight line really fast, like we do with the Pungo or even some of our other touring boats like the, um, like the tsunamis. Um, and just kind of really tailoring that to, to what the customer needs. Yeah, I know that's uh, the thing that I've noticed with my, the tarpon, I almost think of it as like a hybrid kind of, because it's not one of those wide boats that you can stand up on, but it, to me, it outperforms those other wider boats on the water when it comes to, maneuverability, uh, ease of paddling and tracking, you know, uh, my co-host, which I tried to get on here today, but he had to work, whatever. Um, he's got a bona fide okay. and his kayak is much wider, much heavier than mine. Uh, and it, it, to me, it's a little bit harder to paddle and, uh, it's just a little bit harder to manipulate, get on a right. car, get off a car. 
Um, do you, do you guys find those things matter to angling kayakers? They do. And I, I would think that I would say that that's one of the reasons that the tarpon is really popular for us is because it is probably our most versatile boat. Um, it's a boat that as a recreational paddler, you can just take out and paddle and have a good time in. It's a boat that if you want to go fishing out of, you can you rig it up to fish and have uh, you know plenty of speed, plenty of stability, plenty of storage with. Um, if you want to paddle it on a lake, it's great. If you want to paddle it on a river, it's great. If you want to paddle it on, um, you know, in the ocean, it's, it works for that too, because it is a sit on top. And, uh, so the, you know, that that's what makes the tarpon a great boat, but we also have a boat called, uh, like the recon that's just come out, which is a very specific boat for fishing. And, you know, it's, uh, 38 inches wide. And so it's got a ton of stability. You can stand up on it. You can turn around and stand up on it, chase the fish around the boat. Um, so it really just kind of depends on what the customer wants out of the boat. Um, you know, for a long time, fishing out of kayaks was taking people who were kayakers and allowing them to fish. Right. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing the other side of that is we're taking people who want to fish and we're putting them in kayaks. And so they have different expectations out of what a kayak, what a, what a kayak is mm -hmm. and what being in a kayak means because their experience is really focused around fishing. Whereas uh, in the past, a lot of the experience was focused around kayaking and then fishing was kind of a, a bonus to that. Do you find that those people that are anglers that are going into kayaking, uh, what kind of input do they bring to wilderness systems that maybe you guys didn't think of? Were there things that were important to them, important to them that you guys went, oh, why didn't we think of that? Definitely, especially on this last round of, of the recon that we did. Um, you know, we worked with some guys who, um, they do fishing tournaments out of, out of regular boats. And so some of the things that we've talked about is, you know, normally on a boat, you take your rods and they're in, in a vertical position almost always, because there's no other place to put it. And so the ability to have the rods kind of laying down beside you so you can grab one and then grab another one and, and change up really easily, uh, was a really important feature. And so on this newer boat, what we did was we actually have these rod trays that run down the side of the boat. So you can keep a couple of rods stashed on either side and kind of keep them at hand at all times. Um, and it also helps keep them up, you know, down out of the trees. If you're on a river or, or what have you, you're not you're getting blown back into the, into the trees and having your rods get all tangled up. So keeping them down was, was, you know, kind of a really important feature. And then just storage overall. So um, you know, in a kind of a traditional kayak, you either keep things behind you in the tank well and you sort of have to turn around or you have to get out of the boat and get up into the top end of the front hatch. Um, but, you know, now um, having slots beside the seat where you can reach down and grab your tackle and have it all close at hand uh, to change up or having it right under the seat or right behind the seat so that you can keep a lot of tackle right beside you. You can make quick changes uh, to how depending on how the, the day's going, you know, what kind of, um, whether you want to be with soft plastics or, or other types of lures and just being able to change that out real quick. And when did the, when did the pedal drive revolution start? I, I would desperately love to have a pedal drive kayak because I, where I live, it's all reservoirs. They're huge. Right. And, yeah. uh, you know, having something where I could have my hands free and, and pedal around would be great because I could troll. Uh, but when, when did that start? Yeah, so pedal drives, um, you know, I think Hobie was probably really the first company that really went after the pedal drive market and they sort of tinkered with it uh, for, for a while. And it was sort of, you know, treated, I guess, as, as an oddity. Um, you know, it, it was something that, that was kind of on the fringes there for a really long time. And then probably about, I'd say about five years ago was when really pedal drives really sort of kind of exploded into the market, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think that really that is being driven by fishing and the, just the ability to be able to position yourself and move around while still having your hands free to be able to concentrate on fishing. Again, that's kind of goes back to those, that comment we ma I made earlier about having people who are interested in fishing, but they're interested in fishing from kayaks. Mm -hmm. And so doing things differently. So they have that focus and that ability being able to keep their hands free, being able to make more casts, being able to catch more fish because they're not having to have their hands on their paddle, um, you know, really makes a difference over the course of a day. Yeah. And those brands like Hobie and Jackson, you know, those are, I guess what I would consider, you know, elite or premium brands. Definitely. You know, 
Uh, it's, it's almost like they've found their niche and that's, that's all they do. How does wilderness systems break in, break that wall down and go, we are as good or better than some of those guys? Yeah. So really for us, it's all about just making sure that number one, we're listening to the, the customer and what the customer wants, right? We want to make sure that, that folks who are paddling our boats are getting what they're, what they're asking for. So try to make sure we do that. And then we really try to make sure that, you know, we bring that comfort and comfort first again, um, making sure that the seating is comfortable, making sure that, you know, your, your feet are in the right place, just making sure that you can spend a lot of time in a boat and, and be happy about it, right? Um, we kind of really want, what we want is, is for the boat to sort of disappear from the equation, right? You, you need to be so comfortable in the boat that you don't really think about it. You think about what you're doing. You're thinking about having a good time out on the water. You're thinking about fishing, whatever it is. You want, to, want that comfort to be there so you're not thinking about, oh, I have to adjust this or move that on the boat to get comfortable again. Um, and then taking that and melding it to the performance and then um, the other thing that we really try to concentrate on is, is just making sure that the interface is really set up really well. So making sure that, um, you know, if you need tackle, it's right there exactly where you need it. Uh, your rods are exactly where you need them. Uh, so that, again, you don't have to think about where things are. You don't have to watch what you're doing to set your rod down. Um, you know, you don't have to search for where you need to put your paddle, that sort of thing. Uh, and just making sure everything is, is kind of dialed in. And we do that in, in our touring boats as well. So we re, uh, upgraded the tsunamis a few years ago, right? And one of the things that we did there was that we, uh, we added a uh, water bottle holder to the, the underside of the deck because we had been out paddling. And, and one of the complaints was that my, you know, the water bottle was rolling around in the bottom of the boat. It's like, well, okay, let's put that somewhere. Let's do something with it to make it handy and, and, and put it out of the way, but accessible. So now that water bottle resides up under the deck. Uh, there are, you know, pockets on the deck now from the outside where you can put stuff. So, uh, you know, one of the things I like about kayaking is I like to eat while I'm out. So I always <laughs> make sure I have my snacks at hand up there on the, on the deck, you know? Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, just, you know, trying to listen and make sure that things are going exactly where they need to go for, for the paddlers who are going to use the stuff. I'm not going to lie. When you said put the water bottle on the underside of the boat, I thought you literally meant like under the boat. Oh yeah. No, and like, I, like, so if you're inside the boat, you know, it would be like, like under the deck yeah. of the boat. I thought, yeah. how in the hell is that any easier? <laughs> I'd rather have it rolling around. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Oh, and the thing I appreciate about wilderness systems, you guys have a kayak for everything. Uh, yeah. So if, would you mind kind of breaking down the, the different, um, type of activities that wilderness systems breaks their kayaks down into? Yeah. So what I would do is I, I, I would start, I guess, in the middle, which is what we would call a recreational kayak, right? So it's just a sort of a general purpose boat for folks who, um, you know, maybe either are just getting into it or are looking for a boat that's just a little more stable overall. Um, something that's going to be really easy to use, right? Uh, so we have that boat, we have the tarpon and we have, which is a sit on top boat. And we have the pungo, which is a sit inside boat. Mm -hmm. Um, and so then from kind of that middle section, you would go one direction from the Pongo over, you would go into, a, into touring, which is going to be a uh, longer distance and maybe camping overnight, being able to haul more gear and going out into maybe rougher conditions from sort of being on a lake to going to a river or going out to an ocean and being out in, um, you know, sort of what I've got, what we've got going on behind me in this picture here, yeah. uh, you know, big ocean swells kind of taking on that sort of thing. And then you'd move the other direction sort of from the tarpon and you go, it's kind of a general boat, uh, which is good for fishing. And then you go sort of into, into more dedicated fishing craft, right? So you'd move over there into something like the recon, which is going to be, um, you know, super uh, dialed in for, for fishing and be really specific to that, um, to that activity. Does Wilderness Systems have a uh, whitewater kayak or is that under one of the under other uh, products like dagger or perception uh so that's under dagger right now dagger okay. makes the mix all the whitewater boats yeah so we go from wreck to touring to fishing and uh, we find that keeps us us busy enough so uh, oh for sure and it's it's great because you know wilderness systems has figured out this is what we do well there's no reason to do something else when other companies handle that stuff exactly exactly uh, which kayak sells the most? What's the most popular one? So Pungo is definitely the, the most popular boat. 
Um, you know, it, it combines a lot of comfort and stability with a great amount of speed. And uh, it's just a really easy to paddle boat, uh, 12 foot, so it's easy to carry around. Um, and yes, it's definitely our, our most popular. And then the tarpon would be right there behind it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. you know, just kind of a general, really versatile boat. Yeah, I struggled really, really uh, bad about buying a sit in versus a sit on top. Uh, I'm glad I went with sit on top. I, I like them better. They're to me, they're easier to get in and out of, and uh, just offer me a little bit more freedom, I guess. But the bottom half of my legs get really weird collars in the summertime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've actually gotten to where I paddle and sit on tops. So I, I I wear pants now almost all the time, just to kind of stay out of the sun. You just about have to, otherwise you turn into a lobster on the front yeah. half of your legs. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned the recon. Are there any other new products that Wilderness Systems is working on that maybe they're going to come out with in the future? Yeah, so we're always working on something new. Uh, we have a, uh, a recreational boat, a little 10-foot uh, kind of um, recreation-focused set on top that's going to be coming out in the spring. Um, we're dialing it in now and kind of putting the, the latest tweaks on it, and we'll be ordering the mold here in the next month or so, and uh, we'll be... Uh, kind of unveiling that in, in, in the March time frame. Is that to compete with some of the more economy cost boats that are out there? Yeah. So, you know, this is going to be sort of a, a more entry level boat for wilderness systems. Um, but, you know, again, whenever we do anything, we want to make sure that we're bringing kind of that, that comfort. And, and if we're going to do something, we want to make it unique. Um, mm -hmm. And kind of bring our own flavor to it so it will be a sort of an entry-level boat but it's definitely going to have some features that that aren't really kind of out there in the, in the other boats that are on the market i know me and my co-host talk all the time about getting people into kayaking uh, and for me probably one of the biggest barriers is cost uh, whenever someone's looking at a new kayak and they see a wilderness systems where they're where the entry-level pungo is what like eight hundred dollars is that right Yes, it's nine ninety nine. Yep. So when they look at that boat, or they can go to uh, a competitor, you know, some retail store, and pick up a kayak that's a sit in that is maybe three hundred. Mm -hmm. uh, what What would your comment be to someone that was considering those two options? I would say that if three hundred dollars is the only thing you can really afford, and and that's what gets you on the water, then, then go for it. You know, being outside is really the most important thing. Um, what I would say really kind of sets us apart though from boats like that is gonna be uh, the quality of the materials. So, um, you know, just the, the overall quality of the, um, the seating system uh, is gonna be higher, you know, it's gonna last longer. Um, you know, we've got people who have been paddling their boats that they've bought for, for 15 years or so. So uh, that's that would be one. And then the other, side of that would be the amount of comfort that's going to be in a boat like the Pungo overall. So in a Pungo, you know, we've got that phase three seating system that we talked about and being able to stay out all day and, and be really comfortable in the boat. You're going to have uh, pads that are going to be on the side for your knees, uh, easy to adjust um, foot braces and just the amount of attention to detail that we pay uh, on in our designs to make sure that the boat really delivers a really good experience overall. Uh, you know, is what would what would set us apart? Those tiny details are so important. The adjust, the easy to easy to adjust foot pegs. Um, you know, something like you mentioned earlier, making sure plastic is in the right place to offer support and rigidity. Um, the, all those things, those little things, just add up to to make wilderness systems a, a superior boat. It's hands down. There's, there's yep. no other question. Uh, my buddy had a, a sun dolphin. And I don't want to, I don't want to rag on other brands, but you know, we spent a day out on the Creek and I had to basically, I had to stop paddling and let the current of the Creek take me because he couldn't keep up with me. Uh, I don't know if it was the whole design. Uh, his boat was really thin. So it, like whenever he sat on it, it compressed. And I don't know if it deformed the shape of, of the hole or what. He absolutely could not paddle and keep up with me. Uh, I, don't, I don't get it. Yeah. So, you know, just it's, it's like I said, it, we take a lot of time making sure that the boat is really kind of as efficient as possible. Always, you know, we want to make sure that if you're going out, you can paddle maybe a little further than you thought you could when you go out in one of our boats. So. 
And uh, as far as COVID, how has that affected the uh, the water sports uh, recreation field? Uh, so believe it or not, the industry is booming right now. Um, you know, um, I think that a lot of people are taking the money that they would have spent maybe on traveling before and are putting it in things that they can do closer to home. Um, so, you know, we're actually doing really well right now. And, uh, you know, I think things are going to be strong, strong for us this year. Do you think that's something that's going to have a long-term effect? Do you think this will last or will people, uh, once things kind of normalize, do you think they'll stop doing these activities? Uh, I'm hoping that it's going to really kind of spark a love for these sorts of activities and folks that they'll, that they'll continue on with. Um, you know, I kind of feel like once you start getting outside and, and really kind of start connecting, um, you know, it's really easy for that to turn into a, a lifelong love and passion. It has been for me. I know that, uh, like I said, I bought my first boat seven years ago. And before that, you know, I was a, a regular boat guy. And after having a kayak, I don't think I'll ever have another boat again. Yeah, it's been really interesting to see folks moving from, from power boats into kayaking. And, you know, I think it, it it's one of those things that, um, it kind of gives you a sense of accomplishment at the end of the day, right? You know, you, you know, you've put in a lot of, a lot of work to get where you're going. Um, you can see things that you can't see from a regular boat, you know, whether it be on some of the, the smaller creeks and, and rivers and the smaller lakes. Um, and, you know, just being able to be there and be sort of in that quiet moment, you know, it's just a different experience than being on a regular boat. Yeah. Um, out here in Colorado, big things, paddle boarding, uh, have, have you attempted paddle boarding or do you say, heck with that crap, I'm just going to kayak? No, I've, I've definitely paddle boarded before. Um, it's certainly not, um, I'm not going to be trading in my kayak for a, a paddle board anytime soon, but I certainly get the appeal of it. You know, it seems to be, it, it's, it offers you a different perspective by standing up, um, you know, makes it easy to kind of get on and off the board. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I definitely see the appeal to it, but um, definitely going to stay with the kayak from now on, I think. Where did paddleboarding even start? Did someone see a surfer and go like, I want to do that, but on a lake? Honestly, I, I don't know. I think that the guys in the surf were using paddle boards probably first because it helped them get out uh, into some of the bigger waves. And I think that, that that then translated, you know, over to kind of inland waterways from there, I would imagine. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I got to talk to a surfer. Those guys are different too. I, I don't, I couldn't do that. <laughs> well, it's, it's really the cool thing about being on the water is that, you know, I've been able to interact with a lot of different types of people, uh, mm -hmm. you know, people who like to ocean kayak, people who like to fish, uh, whitewater kayakers. They're definitely not, not all the same people, but they're all the same and that they like to, you know, be out and, and kind of, uh, you know, experiencing the outside. Yeah. Uh, the first time I went to the ocean, I, I think it was actually the first time I'd really kayak. Me and my wife went to Myrtle Beach and we tried to do a tandem kayak and we couldn't get past the surf. Uh, of course, we didn't really know the mechanics of how to move a boat around with both of us. And uh, two times we got turned sideways, a wave came in, rolled us back to the beach. Uh, after the second time, when I landed on top of her and kind of scooted her across <laughs> the sand, she said, I'm done. Get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah once you get sideways it's uh it's just kind of hang on and hope at that point uh, there was no hope in the movies. <laughs> i was hoping i didn't drown uh adam is there anything else you'd like to to throw out there as far as uh you know wilderness systems is concerned maybe website best way to reach someone yeah so websites uh wildernesssystems.com you know come check our stuff out and uh you know, interact with us on our Facebook page. We have a Facebook page for our wreck and touring, which is wilderness systems kayaks. And then we have wilderness systems fishing kayaks, which is a little more focused on uh, fishing boats and, and uh, fishing content as well. All right, Adam, thanks for your time. I really appreciate it, man. All right, appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah.